So yeah, um, I went up to the Labour Ward around half eleven at night on the 18th of August. Um, all my family stayed with me in the Labour Ward, um, in the Labour Room, sorry, and um, yeah, it was a strange atmosphere because we'd all, you know, go into silence for a while, you know, we'd all be realising what, what's really happening and then someone would make a joke and we'd all burst into laughter and that's why I love my family. I just need to take this opportunity to just say that I have a wonderful family, a really strong, loving family. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do any of it without them. Um, my waters hadn't broke, it hadn't occurred naturally, so the midwives came in at about half eleven. Um, uh, so my family left, my mother stayed with me, and they broke my waters, and straight away the contractions got so intense, um, really intense. Um, but I did still refuse an epidural, which I'm looking back now. I'm really, really glad I did, and I don't actually, I can't, I don't actually know why I refused it. Um, I just knew I could do it without it, and looking back now, I'm so glad um, that I didn't have the epidural because without it, it, it happened so quick. Um, between them breaking my waters, it actually. I actually dilated a further five centimetres um, within half an hour and I was ready to push. Um, where I feel as with an epidural it would have been a lot slower, especially with the push in. Um, and I could actually feel everything and I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I'm really glad that I didn't have the epidural. Yeah, so around 12 o'clock at midnight, possibly dead on, I started pushing. Um, it was quite it was quite a special moment actually um because I could really feel that Milo was with me and he was telling me that you know I'm not coming out on this push you know relax so I was pushing and you know something was telling me and I'm pretty sure it was Milo you know I'm not coming out on this one just relax so I relaxed and everyone was screaming and you know the room was so intense everyone was telling me to push telling me to push but I was just in my own world and I was like, I'm not, I'm not pushing on this one. So I started to push again. Um, and something was telling me, no, he's not coming out on this one. And then I think on the next push, um, I really gave it my all. Something was telling me that he was going to come out. And I think with three pushes, he came out. And I remember the moment he was born like it was yesterday. He was born at three minutes past twelve on the nineteenth of August. So he made a very special entrance. Um, and it's funny though, because when I was pregnant I always told my family I want Milo to be born at night. I want him to be born at night because I find it really peaceful. I find the nighttime really peaceful and you know it's not rush rush, you know, like the daytime in a hospital. So he was born at three minutes past twelve and I can't help but think that he did that for me. Especially telling me, you know, I'm not coming out on this push, and he arrived at three minutes past twelve. I think it was, you know, it was quite a magical. It was quite a magical time, really. Um, but I remember when he was born. Um, that was like a silence, like no other. It was the most intense silence I've ever experienced, because I remember waiting for him to scream, I remember, I still didn't believe it. I still didn't believe that he was dead. All the way through the labor. And I really needed, you know, proof. Um, so yeah, I remember the moment he was born like it was yesterday. I can't even remember if anyone spoke after he was born. You know, they must have, you know, the midwives must have communicated and the doctors. But in my world, it was just so silent and I was waiting for my baby to just scream, let out a big scream for his mother. I think I remember two very long minutes went by where I didn't say a word. And I eventually just turned to my mum and I said, are they sure he's dead? And she said, yes, darling, I'm sure. 
So I just went, you know, I just went. Past the moment, I really believed. I, I believed them that moment. It's the first time I believed it. And then the next ob obstacle then was obviously seeing him, which I was petrified. I was petrified about seeing him. Um, because I didn't, I was hoping there wouldn't be an obvious abnormality uh, to tell me as to why he died. So my mum actually asked, can I, can I go and see him? I said, yeah, of course you can. So she went up to him and I remember looking at her face to kind of get an indication of whether I hate saying it but scary because I've never seen a deceased person never in my life so the first person that I was going to see who's passed away was my son who I loved more than anyone in the world so it was going to be very hard. I don't know, there was just something really peaceful about it all. Because I asked my mum, what does he look like? And she said, Meg, you have nothing to worry about, he's perfect. And I trusted her. So I asked to see the top of his head first. And he had mousy, light brown, wavy little hair, a little mop of hair and as soon as I seen the top of his head I said show me, I sat up and I said show me and I remember looking at him and I didn't think the pain that I was feeling could get any worse But when I seen my little boy for the first time, which was supposed to be a really joyous, if it was different and he was alive, I would have been screaming with joy. I would have been crying my eyes out. And I could almost, I was almost dreaming about it in my head because all he, all he looked like is he was sleeping, but he was just so perfect. He actually looked like an angel. The worst, that was the worst pain I've ever felt, was seeing someone so perfect and so peaceful. And he didn't have a heartbeat. He was all there, all of his bones, all of his body, all of his organs, his features, his hair, his hands, his toes. And the only thing that wasn't there was a beating heart. And that was the most painful and frustrating the most angry time of my life is because I just remember looking at him and waiting for him to flinch waiting for him to give me something that's how alive he looked I had decided on his name since about 20 weeks pregnant I knew he was going to be Milo I knew he was going to be a Milo and he looked like a Milo Milo Thomas Evans that was his name that is his name It's weird because 
I had a, a dream as well a few weeks before I found out my dad passed away and I had a dream about him and he, when he was born, he looked exactly as he did in my dream. The same angle I was looking down at him and in my dream he was sleeping. I can't help you. I can't help but feel he was. He was uh, just warning me. But he was exactly. He was the Milo I dreamt of. He was the Milo I'd ma I imagined. But just not like this. I remember thinking that. He's he's ev he's everything I wanted, but just not like this. So whilst all this was happening, my placenta actually wouldn't attach. Um, so I had to go in for an operation because I was too exhausted to cooperate, literally. Um, they were trying to get me to work with them to get the placenta out, but I was just way too exhausted. I, I could barely keep my eyes open. I was exhausted. I was heartbroken. I was crying my eyes out. It's just the worst type of exhaustion I've ever experienced in my life. I'd been in labour all day. I'd just seen my son who was dead. And then I had to go in for an operation at about two o'clock in the morning. I remember my mum just looked up to the sky and she said, bring it on, bring it on. And I just said, yeah, bring it on. I got taken back to the room. I had such a long cuddle with Milo, even though I was so exhausted, so heartbroken. I just couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying and the nurse then came in and asked if I wanted some medication to help me sleep and I, I just said yes, yes. Because it was all so emotionally draining, so emotionally damaging, so mentally exhausting. It was just torture, it was living, breathing torture. I remember waking up at around 10 o'clock then, so I'd had about five hours sleep, five, four hours sleep, so it wasn't bad. I remember I just picked up Milo and I felt a little bit more fresh after sleep. So I stopped crying and I kind of just got onto the next, the next challenge now was just, was to make the, the most of my time with Milo. I remember waking up and I remember grabbing him and hugging him and I took pictures of him so I could tell that looking back now I did have you know enough rest to function because I took pictures of him I just I stared at him couldn't stop staring at him I was kissing him on the forehead feeling his skin looking at his hands I put a hat on, I put a hat on him after he gave birth, after I gave birth. So he looked all snuggled in that blanket. I put him around, I put him in the, the stripy blue blanket that my seven year old brother gave to me as a gift for Milo. So he was wrapped in that. I remember what I kept doing was feeling Milo's feet. He had really big feet. He had toes exactly like mine. He looked like me. Milo looked like me. He was just perfect. He was, he was an angel. And when I'm not feeling too negative and I'm positively grieving is what I call it, I really do think the angels just thought he's one of us and we need him. He, we need him up here. So that day then on the 19th, um, my family were all, uh, Milo's family were all coming to visit him. And I remember thinking, like, you know, these people should be coming in with 
balloons and teddies and gifts for Milo. But instead, one by one, they all crept in so hesitantly, not knowing what they were going to see, not knowing what state I was going to be in, just not knowing. And I remember thinking they should all be so different. Yeah, if that was a, that was a hard day because um, I just ha I just had to watch everyone's hearts break one by one all day. That was tiring. It was very hard. Just the heartbreak on their face. It was so mentally destroying to see my family like that. It was such a hard day. And I think the hardest part about it all was that he was so perfect. That was the hardest thing. He looked like we'd just missed him by a minute. His skin was, I thought his skin was going to be so pale, but he was actually really tanned. He was just so gorgeous. His skin was flawless. And he just, he would just look like he was sleeping. So, um, Milo's family was coming and going all day to have their crutches. To say hello, because they had the next day to say goodbye. Um, yeah, it was a difficult day. Everyone just cr was crumbling one by one. It was just a, it was the day of devastation, pure devastation for everyone. Because they weren't expecting, I think everyone was just so scared of what they were going to see, just like me. But the devastation when they realised that he was perfect, that was the hardest thing. And you could almost, you just, I thought, if I stared at him from long, for long enough, he's going to flinch. That's what I kept thinking. And I remember that night actually, I remember cradling him. And I remember staring at him thinking, like, come on, do something. Flinch, breathe. And I remember whispering to him, come back. And I said it louder, come back. I'm saying come back, come back, come back. Because I thought the more I say it, and the louder I started saying it, I thought surely someone has to give him back. Nobody should have to go through this pain. I thought surely someone someone has to give him back if I just say it loud enough. I was so convinced the more I said it that he was going to come back. But then I just broke down. He was the most loved baby I'd ever known. But I don't think I could ever fully explain to anyone how much I needed Milo and how much he meant to me. It's not that I wanted Milo, I needed him. And my plan was, is, was that I was going to have him. And I didn't know that any of this was possible. I didn't know that he could have died. In the sense of being Milo's mum, I'll never change. But who I was before and who I am now, just two completely different people. The night that Milo was born, I was reborn too. I just, I'm, I'll never be the person I was. I think when your baby dies, you just have to create a new you, you have to mould your life around this grief and you have to, you just have to be a new person, you have to build a new you and I'm currently working on it but I know the pain will never go, the grief will never leave. So leaving the hospital 
had to be the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Honestly now, I think this was the hardest thing I had to do out of everything. Um, I will never forget how leaving the hospital made me feel. Dead or alive, Milo was still my son. So, you know, the decision was down to me when I said goodbye to Milo. Um, and on the 20th of August, I decided today was the day. It was a Sunday. It was a day of rest. It was a day of peace. And I could see that Milo was, you know, just starting to deteriorate. And I just knew it was time to leave him in peace. To leave his body to rest. So to actually make that decision was just the hardest decision I've ever had to make. Dead or alive, that baby was still my son. I made that baby, I carried him for eight months and I planned to spend the rest of my life with him. I planned to put him before anything else for the rest of my life. And I had to leave him behind. I had to leave my baby alone in the hospital with no one around him no one to look after him and the hospital's only three, four miles down the road from where I live so I had to go to bed knowing he was just down the road and how I didn't have the strength to run back to him and hold him just one more time, I don't know. I think it was just the knowing that I just didn't want to disturb him anymore, wanted him to be at peace. Didn't want him to be touched anymore, I wanted him to rest. He'd been held so much, cradled so much. Santu spoke to so much in two days. I just couldn't do it to him, I couldn't, but it was so hard. Nothing in my life will compare to that goodbye. Deciding when to say goodbye to my son. It was just the worst day of my life. I remember we were going to say goodbye at half seven at night and the midwife said I'd be in at eight o'clock and I remember, oh my god, we've got another half an hour, this is just going to be so hard because I'll ask for another half an hour and then another half an hour. When the midwife came in to take him down to the morgue, I, I just gave him one kiss and I handed him over. That's something I'll never wish on anyone. Is having to say goodbye to your own child. And being the decision maker of it all. Obviously when I look back now I wish I'd spent more time with him but that would just be asking to keep him forever and I can't do that. I couldn't do that. Happens to 15 families a day in the UK. So every day I wake up and I think 15 families are going to be told that their babies died today.